All right, ladies and gentlemen, again, like I said before, it doesn't matter how cool your product is, how cool your sexy bells and whistles are. If they cannot pay, you don't make any money. So welcome to the stage, Elgo Charge, and he'll be taking it from here. Thank you, sir. For the introduction. And thank you guys for uh, staying with us here uh, this afternoon. I know it's getting late, and I appreciate you guys staying here after the debate we had here with uh, actually all of our partners uh, earlier this, uh, this afternoon. Anyway, I want to walk you through. Well, by the way, my name is Sorel, and I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Algo Charge. Uh, we're a payment service provider focused on basically this binary and forex trading industry. Uh, some of you know us by the All Charge brand, which is another brand that we, that we run in, in parallel. Uh, basically, what I've uh, been asked by uh, the nice gentlemen for, from Conversion Pros is uh, to give you an overview and run through the different considerations and choices you have to go through when selecting a payment service provider. Uh, as the guys said earlier, it doesn't matter how good your platform is and how good your marketing is. At the end of the day, there is a customer at your website, and you want to collect the money from this uh, customer. And you better do it, and you better do it right, because otherwise you've just lost all of your investment in driving that traffic. Uh, so basically, uh, by the way, how many here in, in the audience are actually processing now, or how many are considering or in the process of uh, starting a process? That, that's good. So. There is a majority of people that are interested in process versus those that are processing. So I'll kind of put more focus maybe on the things that are relevant to people that are just starting to, to process. But I'll cover everything as, uh, as, as we go. Uh, basically, when I give this uh, presentation and there is a little bigger uh, odd audience and maybe the time is a little earlier, I run a little poll and ask people what is the major consideration uh, they think is important uh, when selecting a payment service provider. And usually the first thing that comes up uh, by everybody is, uh, is price, and this is why I start by price, uh, but I'll give you my insight on, on that uh, later on. Uh, typically, while most people that come up to us you know, start up with, what's your cost, what's, what's the price? Uh, I think price is only one side of, uh, of the equation uh, because it doesn't really matter how much it costs you to convert a customer. At the end of the day, you need to look at the other side of the equation, and that's the customers that you were not able to, uh, to convert. And at the end of the day, you need to balance the equation and look at your cost and the cost of acquiring these customers uh, versus what it would generate to you if you maybe paid a little higher, maybe 50 points or 1% or 1 more on your processing, but improved your conversion in 10 or 15 or 20%. Uh, what that will do to your bottom line. And this is something that many people are uh, m missing and put, putting aside, and I think it has a very important factor on uh, selecting your, uh, your payment uh, provider. There are other factors that uh, govern or control your approval rates, and uh, we'll go over these uh, later on through the, uh, through the presentation. So it's, it's not only price that uh, really, re really affect. There is issues like uh, choice of payment methods and, and other local payment methods. And again, we'll cover these as, uh, as we go al along. The, the, the other thing, and there is a difference uh, in your uh, selection criteria when you're a startup, you just start processing, and when you're uh, a, a more mature operation and, and your business uh, grows. And this is where you have to look at what I call the portfolio approach. Uh, when you start, you maybe have only one payment uh, solution or one processing solution. But when you grow, you need to look at a portfolio approach and a portfolio cost and the cost of your portfolio and use this portfolio to acquire customers from different regions, uh, dif dif different uh, marketing, mar marketing channels, and so on to optimize your, your costs. So it's not only the direct cost of Visa and MasterCard, it's the portfolio cost of all of your different payment options and how you move them forward in certain areas, put them uh, backwards in other areas to optimize your conversion, uh, your conversion cost. But I, I think, uh, you know, and from, from my experience, that the experience of your processor and uh, processing for Forex and binary option is probably the number one selection uh, criteria. And that affects the whole uh, relation, the whole life cycle of your relations 
with, uh, with, with, with the process. Uh, because when you set up your uh, binary or forex trading operation and you want to start processing, uh, the first most important thing for you is to just start processing. Uh, cost is not an issue because your volume is, is very small and you just need to get your operations to go. There's salespeople out there, you've just uh, rented a big office, you put in the first salesperson, you, you've licensed a license from one of these uh, gentlemen that were up here on, on stage and you want to get the business rolling. So the first thing you want to do is start processing, start processing fast. I think that at this point, price is not a really issue because whatever the cost is, you, com you multiply that by your volumes, the difference is hundreds of dollars per month. It's, it's not millions of dollars per month at, at that stage. Uh, then you want to move into the next phase, which is optimizing your conversion. Now you're starting to see traffic, your volumes are starting to grow. This is where you want to start optimizing. You want to make sure you get more of the leads that are coming in, that you convert more of your customers into paying customers. Uh, and that's your, your second phase. The, the third phase, I would say, is where you're starting to see fraud. And believe me, you set up your binary operation or your forex operation, you start processing, second months, three months, the most, you'll be hit by fraud. Fraudsters are out there. They can immediately identify new brands coming up. They know that in most cases, these guys or you guys that have just started, have less of experience and you'll find them. Or, you know, they'll find you, but you'll find them among your customers. And this is where you need to start looking at risk management, fraud management, uh, maybe at that stage have more tighter fraud management rules, be more cautious on your, on your volume. Now, when you've passed this uh, third stage or probably into your fourth or fifth or sixth months into the operation, you're now processing more significant uh, volumes, this is, this is the right time to start looking at your cost. Now it's the time to look at how do I reduce costs, how do I incre increase my conversion, and how the, these two work to, to, to grow my, uh, uh, my, my operation. The, the other thing when you start up your operation that you need to consider is how do I get started? Uh, usually when you start up your operation, you've you're not regulated uh, yet. As we've seen earlier, there's just one binary, regulated binary op operator uh, currently in, in the market. All the others are non-regulated. Many in process, but not regulated. And you want to process. Uh, today, to get a processing agreement for a non-regulated uh, broker is almost impossible. Uh, and you need to find the right solutions that will enable you to kickstart. Get your operation running until you have that license in hand. And this is where you need to find a partner that will be able to uh, provide your unregulated, uh, maybe operation that is domiciled offshore uh, for now until you get your European or New Zealand or whatever license, uh, a valid uh, processing uh, account. At the end of the process, when you're fully licensed, you have your volume uh, growing up, it's less of an issue and the, the options for you are, are much greater uh, and you're pretty much free to choose between different, uh, different operators. The, the, the other thing that is important is uh, the, the staff of the service provider, the payment service provider. Uh, you need to know that they understand the Forex and binary option trading. They understand the, the essence of the business. They understand the transactions. They understand their users. They can communicate and be a good communication channel between you and the different acquiring banks to bring together your needs and, and and, and your different issues with the different, or vis-a-vis -vis and in front, the different uh, acquiring banks. Uh, a train, trained and education staff can also give you better support that will better fit your specific requirement in, in this market. Uh, and, and I think we all understand that Forex and binary option trading is somewhat unique and somewhat different than many other markets that are being uh, processed. And at the end of the day, this will all uh, basically work to maximize conversion and minimize fraud. When you do that, your revenues uh, will obviously in, uh, in increase. I touched earlier the point of uh, variety of uh, pay payment options. Uh, usually when, when you start, you put out there credit card uh, processing, you put on Visa, MasterCard, and, and you're a happy camper. That will work for the first few days because the volume is still low, you're playing around, you're testing. If you really want to boost your conversion, you need to start looking at specific payment options tailored for your target audience. Uh, 
I'm sure that some of you are familiar with you know, China Union Pay in China, and if you don't have China Union Pay, it's very hard to do business in China. If you look at Carte Bleu in France, if you don't have Carte Bleu in France, it's almost impossible. Uh, another good example is the Dutch uh, market. Not over 90% of the online processing in the Dutch market is through a local payment process uh, solution that is called Ideal. If you don't have Ideal, there's almost no chance that you'll be able to convert users in, in the Netherlands. And there are other examples from most of the markets uh, in, in the world, uh, things like Cashew for the Middle East uh, and Africa markets and, uh, and, and so on. So you want to make sure that you have uh, payment processing solutions that match your marketing efforts. There is no sense to market in a specific market if you don't have optimized payment solutions for that specific market. And I think this is key to convert users uh, in that market. There are other solutions like American Express, for example, uh, which is a niche card. I'd say something like maybe 10% of the credit card uh, traffic is American Express. But uh, customers using American Express can deposit fifty dollars and $100,000 in a single deposit, which is something which is almost impossible with Visa and MasterCard. So you want to make sure that you can convert your customers that do have American Express into depositing with their American Express uh, cards. Uh, the next phase is moving into bank transfers. You have your customers, some of them are getting to be high rollers. You want to improve uh, your interaction with them. And this is the time to convert them into uh, bank transfers. Uh, bank, tra bank transfers, as most of you know, I have my company account, where, wherever it is, I ask the customers to deposit money into my, into my bank account. This is good, but this is not good enough. Uh, the, the next phase of uh, bank transfers is turning these bank transfers into local transfers uh, through providers that have a set of localized bank accounts in many of the countries. And then you can ask your customers to make deposit into your local bank account. That is more cost effective. It's quicker. The customers can do it in their own, in their own currency. They don't need to convert currencies. And in many cases, it's, more, it's even simpler for them more simple for them from a regulatory point of view because there is no tax issues or tax questions or regulators asking why the money is being deposited within the country in the local currency. Uh, so this is the next phase of uh, bank transfers that you want to make sure is available for, uh, for your customers. And there is another variety uh, or flavor of bank transfers, which is real-time online bank transfers. Uh, like uh, ELV in Germany or so forth in France and, uh, uh, and other solutions in other countries, which make it very easy for customers to make bank transfers, almost as if it was a credit card transaction. Uh, the other benefit is that the approval is immediate. Once the customer approves the payment, it's automatically updated in your CRM, in your back office. You can see the money, and you can allow them to start processing. And as I've said, I think it's very important to match your marketing efforts with your payment uh, capabilities. There's very little sense in marketing in places where you cannot uh, accept payments and, uh, and, and vice versa. Another thing to touch is, uh, is currencies. We have seen people come to us and say, I want to process only US dollars. I know it's simple. I know it's easy. It's easy for your management. It's easy for your financial reconciliation. It's easy for everybody, but it doesn't mean it works best. Uh, your customers would pretty much feel more comfortable to deposit in their local currencies. And the other benefit of that is it reduces uh, the risk of fraud. Many times a customer deposits 100 euros, and then on his uh, credit card statement, he sees $127.30. He doesn't identify the deposit. I never deposited $127. He calls his issuer, and here you have a chargeback. If you process the customer, it is local currency, you reduce the risk of, uh, of chargebacks. There is another benefit because there is many times additional costs for your customers uh, when they deposit in, different, in their different currency than their base currency. Uh, so if, if you process in their local currency, you make it cost effective for them, uh, for them as well. The other side of currencies is settlement. So it's, one thing is, what currency do I collect the money from my customer? The other question is, how do I get the money from my processor? Obviously, the processor can convert everything into US dollars. And the first question is, OK, at what rate? 
Uh, and the other question, and the other option is, have your processor uh, pay you in the different currencies. It makes it more cost efficient for you, it's more transparent, it's easier to reconcile, and it works best. Uh, some people uh, look at some major currencies and they ask to be uh, paid in the major currencies where most of the volume is, and some secondary uh, or second level currencies convert these into uh, a leading currency that also works, uh, also works well. Kind of touched uh, risk and fraud uh, earlier, uh, but I want to focus uh, and spend a couple of seconds on this, uh, on, on this now. Uh, typically when we look, look at the fraud and, and risk, uh, we're usually combining two different fraud mechanisms or two different risk mechanisms uh, to, together. One is fraudsters, and fraudsters is people that are cheating, that are taking somebody else's credit card, using it to make a deposit, and usually they come back again to you uh, at a later stage, ask to withdraw the money to a certain bank account, and this way take money from a stolen credit card and move it into a bank account that they have uh, access to. Uh, the other uh, type of fraud is what we call, or is known in the industry as friendly fraud. And these are legitimate users, people that are legitimate, you have compliance on the users, they have used their own credit card, they lost their money, they don't like it, and they file up for, for a chargeback. Uh, basically, when you look at a payment service provider, you want to see how they deal with these two uh, different sources of, uh, of fraud. Uh, fighting real fraud, is, is hard, but there are automatic tools, there are databases, uh, there is experience, and most of all, uh, you need to look at a provider that processes significant volumes in this industry. Once your processor works with a lot of value, volume in this industry, he sees a lot of users. When we see a lot of users across many platforms, we can easily identify fraudsters. Uh, fraudsters have very uh, specific and uh, identified identifiable uh, behavioral patterns which are easily uh, determined and picked up by our systems and can immediately blocked. Uh, so these are fraudsters and I think that uh, at least from our experience uh, we can reduce or a good payment service provider can reduce the amount of real fraud to very very low uh, numbers uh, because they can be picked up uh, if all the right measures are in place pretty quickly. Uh, friendly fraud is, is a major issue but unfortunately, uh, the way to, to, to fight or deal with friendly fraud is mainly customer support, and that is something that you as an operator will need to, uh, to provide and, uh, and deal with. We can help uh, with our experience. We can help by monitoring the traffic, limiting the traffic, uh, and using filters to limit the number of transactions a user can perform on a specific card, uh, via a specific email, from a specific IP, uh, to limit the, the risk uh, for friendly fraud, uh, but this is, uh, or friendly fraud is something that uh, needs to be dealt on a customer support level. Your customer support uh, team needs to be ed educated, they need to know how to identify unsatisfied customers and how to deal with them as, uh, as friendly fraud appears. One other thing you need to look at uh, is the back office and reporting tools of uh, the payment service provider. Uh, most people overlook this, uh, this issue, but at the end of the day, your team, your finance team, your risk management team, your sales team, your support team will be using the uh, payment service provider back office, and it's something you need to feel comfortable with. Uh, different people feel different, differently or like or dislike different, uh, different applications, and you, I suggest that you have your team look at the, uh, the back office application and the reporting tools off your uh, payment ser ser service provider. Uh, have your finance team play with it. Have your risk management team play with it. See that they have a good feeling and that they're happy to work with these, uh, with these systems. Uh, look at some other benefits. Uh, what other data, what other information, what other tools are provided within the back office? Is it only transaction data? Is there business data? Uh, is there financial data that I can, uh, that I can uh, make use of? The other thing that uh, is that you need to consider, although uh, this is something which is pretty much solved by most of the people that were sitting on, on this uh, 
on the stage earlier, and that's the, the integration. Uh, in most cases, somebody that will come to us for processing will already license a platform from one of these uh, partners of ours, uh, and as a result, they will be already integrated uh, with the platform. Uh, so there is no question of integration or integration time. Once they're integrated, you're integrated, and you can start processing. Uh, but uh, despite the fact that they're already integrated, uh, there are some payment options or some integration issues that you want to consider and make sure that they're there for you. Uh, obviously, the basic uh, in in the integration module is a server-to-server -server interface, and that's something which is pretty transparent for you as an operator. But in addition to that, uh, you want to see whether virtual terminals are available, and a virtual terminal is a tool that will enable your sales team, your uh, salespeople to run transactions while they're on the phone with the customer and run the transactions for them. This is very useful and uh, you want to make sure that it's, it's there for you. Uh, and the other thing is mobile payments. A lot of these platforms are converting into mobile and you want to you make sure that your payment service provider supports mobile payments, uh, which you know, when we meet here probably next year will be a bigger part of, uh, of the traffic. Support is something that, again, people sometimes overlook, uh, but it's something you need to look at. Where is support provided from? Uh, the, the, time, the time frame, the time zone supported is, uh, is, is supported on. How do I reach support? Is it email support? Is it phone support? Is it 24 hours support? Uh, and, and, and so on. You want to make sure that when something goes wrong, there is something at the end of the line, there is somebody at the end of the line that can support you. Uh, there is nothing more annoying uh, than a customer trying to make a deposit, deposit not going through, and you cannot get somebody from the payment service provider to assist you with that, uh, that issue, and, and that is a major uh, thing to consider when looking for a payment service provider. Uh, what I suggest, and this is true for, for support and true for many of the other uh, parameters we've been going through, ask your friends. This is uh, typically a very small industry. Ask the uh, platform providers for their experience with the payment provider and make your, uh, make your decision. One thing we're uh, being asked about many times is PCI. That's the payment card industry uh, data security standard, uh, which is being pushed by Visa, MasterCard, American Express, uh, and puts a lot of restrictions on the ability of the website to accept payments via, via credit cards. Uh, basically, there's a, there's a link here to uh, the PCI organization uh, website where you can get a lot of information on that. But basically, or in a nutshell, uh, I think the world splits into two. Uh, if you're not handling or touching the credit card information, you don't care about PCI. It's none of your business. Uh, if you are uh, handling or if credit card information is being transferred through your systems, it doesn't even have to be stored, but it is transferred through your systems, then PCI is something you need to consider and something you need to discuss with your payment service provider. Uh, and consider whether you want to implement some of the PCI requirements within your, your website or not. It's a strategic decision, I would say. Uh, but one thing you need to remember that PCI is not a one-time uh, not, not effort or event. It's something that has to be repeated annually and the expenses associated with PCI can be very substantial. Uh, so you need to consider the complete situation, see if it really makes business sense for you to have that card information uh, being transferred through your systems or not. If it is, then you need PCI, but you need to consider that it's an ongoing investment. If not, you can stay away from uh, the PCI route by having your PCI compliant uh, pro provider. This can be an important factor for you uh, when you're just starting your business, the time to, to start processing. Uh, usually when people come to us, they've just signed up an agreement with one of the platforms, they set up their operation, they've started recruiting people, and they want to get going. And now the question is, how fast can I start processing? Uh, usually, uh, you know, people will, take, will tell you it's a matter of weeks, and it takes a little longer than weeks. 
Uh, there are solutions out there uh, that can get you processing within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, I suggest you look around, ask the right questions, and make sure that the processor you select, especially your first processor, the one that you really want to get going with and start processing with, can really deliver a valid uh, processing solution within, within a very short uh, period of time. Otherwise, these things can get delayed and, and run into weeks and months before you can get processing. And at that time, you have your office sitting, you're paying salaries, and, and no income. The other thing you need to be aware of is upfront payments. Uh, my recommendation, stay away from places where or which require upfront payments. Uh, I usually uh, want to be in a place where I pay after something is delivered, not in advance. And, and I've seen uh, other, other cases. So make sure you don't want to, you're not being asked to pay anything in advance before you get your processing account. Sorrel? Sorrel. Uh, just need to kind of wrap it up real quick. I am wrapping up. This is 10 out of 10. Perfect. Thank you, sir. 20 more minutes. <laughs> Anyway, uh, probably the last, uh, not probably, but the last item on my list before the, the bonus slide that I prepared for you guys. Uh, look at scalability and room to grow. You're started, uh, your needs are very limited, you just want to get there and start processing, but look six months ahead, look 12 months ahead, and look at your needs at that time and see that you're not going into a dead-end solution. Uh, see that you can get additional payment options, additional currencies. Uh, there is scalability in the systems that can handle your growing traffic. Uh, that the billing services that you'll be needing, recurring payments, maybe storage of credit card information. Uh, all of these things are in there in the platform uh, and you can utilize them as, as you go. Because otherwise, starting with a new payment processor after you're there with a, with a processor for six months, months or nine man, months, you have your database of users there, you have your trained, your staff is already trained with using their systems, moving into a new system is a, is a pain. So make sure that there's scalability in there, there's room to grow, there's features out there that will match your future, uh, future needs. For those of you that stayed here with me uh, to the end of the presentation and stayed awake, uh, there is a bonus. Uh, look away for the PSP that gives away an iPad when you start processing for them. And uh, it's great fun and uh, productive. And another thing before I thank you guys for staying with us and going into the questions, uh, James, our sales manager, is somewhere here. And he asked me to invite everybody for a drink of, uh, of scotch in our, in our booth. So you're all invited uh, to celebrate the, the finish of uh, this conference. Any questions? So I can go and get an iPad. You can go and get an iPad scotch. and a scotch. Nice. And celebrate. All right, let's give a hand for all the charts. Thank you very Thank much. You.